Chapter 24 It was late summer, and the sun shone golden on the fields of ripening grain. Gunhild could tell from the farms that she sailed past that it was harvest time. The wheat was a beautiful honey-yellow color, and the kernels hung heavy on the stalks. As she made her way first down the river and then north, Gunhild imagined her arrival in the village of Strayonashal and her reunion with Yadith and her family. She pictured what harvest time in the winter would be like, Last year had been harsh, but things were certain to be better. There would be enough wheat to last the winter, and it would be time to plant winter cabbage and onions soon. There would be lots of time spent around the fire again, but this time she would have some stories to tell, too. Gunhild spotted the buildings of Strayonashal near midday of her third day of sailing. She sailed up to the mouth of the river, then ran down the sail and rowed to the shore. After pulling the boat up the shore away from the water's edge, she set off toward Yadith's family's house. The village looked much the same, but everything felt different to Gunhild. She was returning by choice now. She was dependent on no one, and she had two gold coins in her purse. She found that the farmers of Strayonashal had already begun reaping, and she passed neighbors busy in their fields bent low with their sickles, leaving long lines of cut stalks as they went. Some straightened and stretched and waved at her as she passed. Soon she approached Yadith's farm, and she could see people at work in the distant fields. She would have gone straight to them, but she thought she should first check inside the house. "'Be well, everyone,' she called out as she opened the door. Inside the house sat Madwin, nursing a baby only a month old. "'You had the baby,' said Gunhild. "'I'm so glad. How are you feeling?' Madwin gave Gunhild an odd look. Gunhild couldn't quite tell what her expression implied. "'I am well,' said Madwin. "'What is the baby's name?' asked Gunhild, coming closer to look. Cuthbert, said Madwin. We didn't think you would return. Why are you here? I want to see Yadith, said Gunhild. Is she here? No, she's not, said Madwin. I'll go find her in the field, then, said Gunhild, still smiling. Cuthbert, very good name. Gunhild left the house and went past the garden to the wheat field, trying to pick out Yadith among the figures at work, but she couldn't see her. Instead, she approached Winston, who was close. Be well, she called. It's good to see you again. Is Yadith nearby? Winston straightened his back and wiped the sweat from his forehead. He looked at Gunhild scornfully and said nothing, and Gunhild was taken aback by his reaction. What's wrong? she asked. Yadith isn't here, he said. She left after you did. What do you mean? asked Gunhild. She said she didn't want to be without you, so she left, explained Winston, just after Cuthbert was born. She took some food and a blanket and said she was going to look for you. Gunhild tried to make sense of the idea. She just left? she asked. She just left, said Winston, because of you. Where did she go? No one knows, shouted Winston. His voice cracked and Gunhild could see tears in his eyes. She said she would go to Yoverwich because you had mentioned it before. She walked? asked Gunhild. She walked, said Winston. Gunhild could see that Leofwein, Boya, Yadlu, and Sprott had stopped working and were approaching. They stopped a short distance away to listen. And she hasn't returned? asked Gunhild. It's been a month, said Winston. No, she hasn't returned. Gunhild looked about in confusion. She couldn't think what to do next, and she couldn't concentrate with Winston's eyes on her. His suffering showed on his face, and it hurt her to see it. She felt guilt well up in her stomach. She knew she had to do something, but didn't know what. How far is it to Yoverwich by land? she asked desperately. Forty, fifty miles, maybe, said Boya, standing behind her. She would have made it there and back again by now, easy, unless... Boya's voice trailed off. Gunhild turned to look at him and felt the coldness of his glare. I'll go find her, she said. I'll go back to Yoverwich. I can make it there in three days by boat. No one said anything, but she could almost hear their thoughts. There was no guarantee that Yadith would be there. I'll find her, I promise, insisted Gunhild. I'll go today and search the whole city. 
She looked at Winston, hoping to see his expression soften, but he turned his eyes away. Not wanting to wait longer, she began to walk back the way she had come. She heard quick footsteps behind her and saw Iadlu following closely. You're going to need some supplies, said Yadlu. How are you on food? I have enough, said Gunhild. I'll refill my water skin before I go. Tell me more about what Yadda said before she left. They came to a stop beside the vegetable garden, and Yadlu sighed. She said she was going to find you, that's all, said Yadlu. She did say she would start with the overwitch. She took some bread and cheese and left. We told her not to, but she went anyway. I'm sorry, said Gunhild. I should have... She found herself unable to say what she should have done, but she didn't want to waste more time, so she thanked Iadlu and turned to walk back to the boat, then stopped. You'll tell her I was here, right? She said to Iadlu. If she comes back, tell her I'll find her here. Tell her to wait for me. I'll tell her, said Iadlu, and gave Gunhild a brief smile. The trip south was miserable, but only because the boat could not go fast enough for Gunhild. She pushed the fairing as hard as it could go, and sailed from the moment she awoke until it was too dark to see. As she sailed, she tried to account for why Yadath had not yet returned. When Gunhild had first arrived in Yoverwich, Yadath would still have been at home. If Yadath took a week to reach Yoverwich, looked for Gunhild, then took another week to walk home, she should have been back already. Was she still in Yoverwich looking? Did she continue down the river? Did she get on a boat to Rome? Gunhild's insides clinched every time she thought of Yadath sailing off into the unknown, where she might never find her. Gunhild arrived at Yeoverwich near dark on the third day, and she decided to camp outside the city walls. She hadn't eaten much, she hadn't wanted to take the time, so now she started a campfire and cooked the two dace she had caught coming up the river. She slept that night sick with worry and woke in the morning to begin searching. She searched the entire city on both banks of the river. She trudged laboriously up and down each street and trackway, saying nothing, looking at each person she passed in the hope of a glimpse of white gold hair. She looked everywhere, but her thoughts were distracted by all the places that Yadith might be unseen. Outside the city walls, just as Gunhild was coming in. Coming out of a house a moment after Gunhild had passed by. Gunhild grew hungry, but she kept walking, not wanting to go fishing again, and not wanting to spend anything from her two remaining coins. She finally stopped searching after having scoured the entire city, and she went to fish again on the river. That night Gunhild couldn't sleep. Her searching continued to echo in her mind, and she was unable to quiet her thoughts. She needed to decide what to do next. If Yadith was on her way back to Strayonashal, then Gunhild should go back to her home to wait for her. But if Yadith had moved on to another city, then Gunhild would never find her. Not long ago, the world had seemed huge and full of adventure. Now the thought of finding one person in a world so large seemed a hopeless task. The next morning, Gunhild took three fish with her to the market stalls by the river. She traded them for some bread and an apple, then sat and ate while surveying the passers-by. She was nervous about talking to people, not wanting to be a bother to them, for she no longer had goods to trade or money to spend. She prepared her question ahead of time so that if she got flustered, her English would not fail her. Then she started on one side of the market and began asking each person one by one. Have you seen a girl, thirteen years old, with blonde hair? She is not from here, but came here looking for someone else. Many people said no, but quite a few others said something akin to, there are many girls with blonde hair, and of course it was true. Even if Yadith had come through this very market the week before, she might not have been noticed by anyone. Gunhild began to wander again, and soon arrived at the large stone church. She thought about Yadith and her religious devotion, and decided that Yadith might well go to a church to pray, especially if she was searching for Gunhild. Holding on to that hope, Gunhild sat on the ground near the door of the church and scrutinized the faces of each person who passed, but found no luck there either. If she could be sure that Yadath was actually in the city, Gunhild would have stayed forever, searching each day, but she had nothing to go on except Winston's guess. She could, of course, continue to travel. She could go to Paris and Aachen and even Constantinopolis with its two great walls and its elephants and camels. 
and maybe one day Yadith would appear as she turned a corner. A safer bet, however, was to return to Strayanashal and wait. As much as it seemed like giving up, it was probably the best solution. Gunhild could only hope that Yadith would also give up and return home, and she would be there waiting. Continuing to check every face she passed, Gunhild walked out of the city and back to her boat, and began once again the journey to Strayanashal. Gunhild arrived at Yadith's family's farm, exhausted and defeated. The men were outside threshing the wheat, but Gunhild went first to the house to see Yadlu and Madwin. She entered the house carefully, unsure how they might react to her. Yadlu was grinding flour, and Madwin was spinning yarn. Cuthbert was swaddled and sleeping next to his mother. Gunhild sat down. I couldn't find her, she said. I looked all over you, over which... If she didn't go there, I don't think she's there now. Thank you for trying, said Madwin. I'm so sorry, said Gunhild. I know, said Madwin. Silence settled momentarily as Gunhild decided what to say next. Eventually she asked, May I stay here? With you? I want to be here when Yadith returns. Madwin didn't answer immediately, but continued to spin the wool thoughtfully. We don't have much, she said. I will work, said Gunhild. Madwin set down her spindle and looked at Gunhild and sighed. My daughter wanted to be with you so much, she left us to go find you. If you want to wait for her here, you may. Also, said Gunhild, please take this. It's for my keep, and to thank you. She pulled out one of the remaining gold coins and handed it to Madwin. Madwin took it, her eyes wide, and then began to tear up. Yadlu came and sat beside her to comfort her, and Madwin wiped away tears from her cheek. "'What are you crying about gold for?' asked Yadlu. "'We're going to have meat for the winter,' said Madwin, and she hugged Yadlu, and then Gunhild. The harvest continued, and Gunhild put in long hours with the family, threshing and winnowing the grain. It was exhausting, but Gunhild was determined to prove that she wouldn't be a burden. The men, especially Winston, remained cold toward her, and she sensed they blamed her for Yadith's departure. Yadlu often ended up assigning her jobs and teaching her things. Yadlu was no stranger to farm work, and she showed Gunhild and Sprott the best way to winnow the grain, tossing the basketful of threshed wheat up in the air to let the wind blow away the chaff. After a long week of work, the grain was bagged, and the prior came with two assistants to inspect the grain and take the abbey's share. 
Gunhild took to looking after Cuthbert whenever Madwin needed it, and she also accompanied Madwin when she went to buy supplies with the coin Gunhild had given her. Madwin arranged with one of the neighbors to buy half their pig when it was time to slaughter it, and she bought stores of salt, cheese, cloth, and leather. She bought better tools for the men as well, axes, saws, chisels, and knives. Gunhild could see how carefully Madwin planned the purchases. There was no sense in buying anything frivolous. Everything needed to last a long time and serve a purpose. She seemed determined to stretch Gunhild's gift as far as she could. The weather was already getting colder as the last of the tasks of the harvest season came to an end. Soon it was the Feast of Michaelmas. Gunhild had been with Iadith's family for three weeks, but still Iadith hadn't returned. As she went about her tasks each day, Gunhild always kept a lookout, expecting that at any time Yadath might come walking across the fields from the southwest, but it never happened. The day before Michaelmas, the villagers gathered to celebrate. Everyone assembled on the green between the village farms and the abbey gates, and a boar was roasted for hours until it was perfect and tender. The prior donated a barrel of beer, and the families brought bread, turnips, cabbage, butter, eels, and the last of the bilberries and sloes. The families ate together on the green, and then a procession of dancers arrived to the sound of a flute and a drum. At the head of the line of dancers was someone under a sheet, with a fake horse's head projecting from the top. The head was both comical and creepy. The eyes were black glass, and they made the head seem eerily real, despite the mane made of yarn and the stick in place of a neck. The horse danced up to one villager after another, and they touched its head for luck. Some made wishes. Gunhild saw that Winston was looking hesitantly at the horse from where he sat with the rest of the family. Madwin nodded at him and gestured for him to go up, but he shook his head. Madwin urged him on, so Winston rose and joined the line of other villagers. He waited his turn, then approached cautiously and reached out to touch the horse head and lean in close to speak. Gunhild watched him, and though she couldn't hear anything over the music, she thought she knew what he had wished for. Summer was over, and there was less to do on the farm, but Madwin bought more wool, and she, Yadlu, and Gunhild spent much of their time spinning. They couldn't weave the yarn because they had no loom, but there were always people willing to trade for yarn. On days that she didn't spin, Gunhild fished, and it was often she who supplied dinner for the family. Despite this, Winston still hadn't warmed up to her, and he rarely talked to her. When she asked him a question, he answered briefly without looking at her. Nevertheless, Gunhild decided that she needed his help for what she had planned, so one day when she found him chopping wood, she sat down on a nearby log to talk to him. "'Will you help me build a house?' she asked. Winston lowered his axe and looked at her skeptically. "'For who?' he asked. "'For Yadith, said Gunhild. "'You're that certain she's coming back?' asked Winston. I'm certain that if she comes back, I want to give her a house, said Gunhild. I want to give her a house big enough for a family, with chickens and a pig. I want her to have a vegetable garden and a field of wheat. I want to give her a beehive so she can have honey. She'll need a cow for milk, or maybe some goats. And who will help her with the cow and the pig and the goats? I will, if she wants me to, said Gunhild. If not, that's okay. If she wants me to leave when she returns, she can have the house but I want it for her. Winston considered for a moment. What if she never comes back? Then you have me as a neighbor, I guess, said Gunhild. Winston seemed to consider the idea, then pursed his lips and nodded. I'll help you build your house, he said. Let's go talk to the prior. They went to the abbey together that afternoon to discuss building another farm on abbey lands. They were led to one of the wooden buildings where Brother Calling and two other monks sat at writing desks. There was a small fire and some tallow candles, but it was still gloomy and dark. On desks and shelves there were books and rolls of parchment, and one monk was going through a long list of items on a scroll, line by line. Gunhild wished she could read the Roman letters, only knowing runes herself. The prior invited them in and heard their request to lease Abbey lands for a new farm. Gunhild asked that it be within view of the sea, so a patch of ground to the south was selected. It was unbroken ground and would need to be cleared before it was ploughed. It might take all winter. 
The prior picked up a quill and dipped it in ink, then looked to Winston. Who shall be listed as the tenant? Yadith, said Gunhild. The prior frowned. Are you Yadith? he asked. Winston shook his head. Yadith is my daughter, but she is not here. But as my unmarried daughter, she isn't the head of a household. Then let me, said Gunhild. My father is dead. I have left my home. Put me as the tenant. Very well, said the prior. And your name? Gunhild Kettle's daughter, she said. The prior wrote it on the paper, and the next day Gunhild and Winston began to build a house. They took Sprott with them and began to map out the foundations on the site Gunhild had chosen. They cleared the topsoil, pounded in stakes to mark it, and began digging. The weather was chilly, and a light rain fell as they worked. Gunhild was thankful for her wool hat and cloak at first, but she got overheated and had to remove them. By the end of the first day there was little more to show than a shallow rectangle, but Gunhild had seen a house built before, and she knew it would progress steadily. Soon they were ready to cut poles for the frames. On that morning, Winston brought her to the woods along with Sprott, and Leofwein came too. They discussed which trees would make the best poles, and showed Gunhild where to cut, then stood back and watched as she and Sprott swung the axes. As she chopped and the two men watched her, she wondered if they were judging whether she was serious about building a house. She was intent on proving herself, and kept going long after her hands were numb with the impact. As the work progressed, the others helped even more. Leofwine showed her how to split logs into boards and trim the edges. Boya helped cut long willow branches to weave the walls. When it was time to thatch the roof, Alfred, Duna's husband, came to help as well. After a few weeks, Gunhild was able to start a fire in the stone hearth of her own house. The final gold coin that remained proved very useful now, for she was able to outfit the farm with the basics. A straw mattress, a bucket for water, bags of wheat, and a grinding stone. With that in place, she moved in and slept her first night alone in the house. She was expecting Yadith's family to go back to their own chores now that the house was built, but to her surprise, the next morning, Madwin and Yadlu arrived with baby Cuthbert. Good morning, she said. Welcome. What brings you here? Yadlu showed her two shovels. You'll need a garden, she said. We brought some seeds. Each day that passed that Yadith did not return hurt a little, but Gunhild kept telling herself that it was only a matter of time. If Yadith didn't return until spring, she would still arrive to find fields ready for planting. If she didn't return until the following summer, she would find a farm with chickens, goats, and an overflowing garden. Even if she didn't return for years, there would be a home ready for her when she did.